good morning, C3. How's everybody doing this morning? Okay, I'm going to try that one more time, let you wake up a little bit. How's everybody doing this morning? Hey, there we go. There we go. Hey, we're, set, we're so excited you're with us this morning. You're worshiping with us on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we've got uh, all our students and kids in here right now, and we're excited uh, to have you guys in here. We're excited of, of these opportunities we have to worship together um, as families and, and lift up our, our, voice, our voices to, to our Lord. Uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 10 this morning, continuing our Romans series. So if you want to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 10, uh, that's where we're going to be spending our time uh, this morning morning, uh, but picture this. The hour of darkness is descending upon Middle Earth. The armies of Mordor have crossed the great river at Osgiliath as the final defense before the capital city of Gondor, Minas Tirith, and Gandalf knows that they are out of options and they need to send for help, right? So against the orders of the steward of Gondor, Gandalf sends Pippin the hobbit up to light the beacons of Minas Tirith. Right, to call for help across all of Middle Earth to, his, to the brothers in, in Rohan. And Pippin, in this great feat, scales this rock wall behind, past the guards, and sneaks up behind and lights this, this big stack of wood and hay and straw that's ready to be uh, lit up and send out this big smoke signal across uh, Middle Earth. And as he lights it up, Gandalf goes to the edge of the city and he lifts his eyes and he sees in the distance, in the peaks leading away from the city, he sees the lights of hope dawn as they, as one after another, the beacons are being lit across, sending the message, the distress call out across Middle Earth, right? And finally, it comes to a head whenever it's finally seen at the capital city of Rohan. And here's what happens next. Check this out. about you, but I'm ready to preach now. I'm, my, my blood is coursing through my veins now a little bit. I'm a big Lord of the Rings nerd, so, uh, so I'm a little pumped up now, as, as, as they say. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just excited. Uh, that, gets me, that gets me pumped. Um, and if you don't have any Memorial Day plans, might I suggest... Uh, that you enjoy the greatest cinematic experience you could ever ever hope to ima- ever hope to dream of, right? Um, in, in Lord of the Rings, it'll take it'll be a great well it'll be a, a well spent day because it will take you a full day of twelve hours of, of viewing that. Um, but but man, it'll be worth it. Uh, and just like. Uh, the beacons of Minas Tirith being, being lit and being, the distress call being sent out. In our text today in Romans chapter 10, there is a distress call being sent out. And there is um, a great need that, that, that has to be met. And really, it has to be met by the church. Um, a church that's willing to say, wherever he leads, I'll go. That's where we're going to be this morning, is in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. Um, to help understand kind of this whole section, this falls in this section of Romans that oftentimes is like kind of just passed over, overlooked. It's a little confusing, um, but in order for us to understand it a little bit better, uh, we have this great, I, ho- I hope you've been taking advantage of our uh, From Sunday resource page. You can scan right here uh, to, to find different resources, different books, uh, different video resources. And one of them I want to highlight for you is actually uh, a Romans professor from Ozark Christian College, Michael DeFazio, has done a video series teaching through the book of Romans. And session eight specifically, it's kind of like a bird's eye view of Romans chapters nine, 10, and 11. And it really kind of helps unpack uh, what, what, this, what this section of Romans is all about, this section that is easily uh, just skipped over, overlooked, because it's kind of confusing for us to understand sometimes. Uh, so I would, I would highly encourage you to check that out. But if I could make one observation about Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 for you this morning, um, it would be this. It doesn't fit 
Like it doesn't, it, at least at first glance, it doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the book. It seems like Paul takes a hard right turn when he comes to Romans chapter nine uh, compared to everything else that he's been talking about. I mean, Romans chapter eight that we talked about the last few weeks, that Robin's talked about the last few weeks, seems to be what Paul has been building to throughout his entire letter, right? It's like, this is, this is everything has been leading up to this, this great presentation that, that, hey, there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, right? That like that he has put to death the law of sin that's at work within us and he's given us his spirit to be able to defeat um, and overcome temptation in all these different ways, the spirit that's at work within us and who can bring any charge against us because we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And it seems like, honestly, if you took out Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 and just went straight to Romans 12, after, after the ending of Romans 8, it seems like it would flow pretty well because Paul says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, right? It seems like those thoughts naturally flow together. But it seems like, I want you to flip back to Romans chapter 8 in your Bibles if you have them there with you. And starting in verse 37, this is what he says. I want you to think through what Paul's saying here. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it seems... In this moment, if you can just imagine it, Paul writing these words down or speaking them out loud so that somebody else can write them down on his behalf, it seems that he pauses right here at the end of that chapter and he's kind of overtaken by, by another truth, right? Like this truth of the gospel is almost overshadowed by another truth that, that Paul knows full well and it's that some people, some people that he knows very well, and that he would say are his brothers and sisters, they have rejected this truth of the gospel. They have chosen to, to throw it to the side. They haven't, they haven't accepted it as true or real. They haven't put their faith and trust in Jesus and who he is and what he's done. And the sweet taste of the gospel has turned sour in, their, in Paul's mouth because he thinks, oh, that, that person's rejected this truth. That person has rejected this life that, that Jesus is, is offering them, right? Like that person has, has turned away. And my question, I guess, this morning is, have you been there? Have you been there when you've heard the gospel proclaimed and then you, you start thinking about that brother or sister? You start thinking about that spouse. You start thinking about that coworker or that friend that has chosen a different life, has chosen to, to walk away from the truth of the gospel, has heard it, maybe, or maybe they haven't, and they, they've chosen to, to live a different life. This is where Paul finds himself in Romans chapters 9 through 11. And honestly, I think what, what Paul is trying to tell us in this whole section is that we are messengers, right? Like we've been sent whenever there's people who don't know the truth of the gospel, we, the church, are messengers sent out. Uh, to preach that good news. And this is what Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15 says. Let's read it together. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on, on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. See, Paul actually starts off this whole section in chapter 9 talking about how he's in agony over this truth that his brothers and sisters don't know the gospel, haven't responded to the gospel. They've rejected it. They've walked away. And he actually says, I wish that all of the, all of the good things that I have in Christ would be taken from me if they would come to know him, right? If they would come to, to understand this truth of the gospel, right? But we see his passion coming back alive in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. He's just on fire right here. Like, how can they come to know if we don't, if we don't go? And really, honestly, I think Paul is trying to communicate one simple thing. This is, what he's, this is what he's trying to tell us this morning. We have been sent to speak the truth of the gospel. We have been sent to speak the truth of the gospel. Paul kind of lays out in, this, in these few verses like a sequence, and, uh, an order of, of events that, that how somebody comes to be saved, 
right, of how somebody goes through this, and we have a part to play in this. No, we're not the ones who do the saving, and we're not the ones who have the power to change hearts. That's all God's, God's end of the spectrum, right? Like, that's completely him, and none of it is us, right? But we have a part to play, and uh, I really what I want to do for our time together is I kind of want to work backwards through this text, and, and, and look at, ask three simple questions of us that I think it's good for us to think about. If, if really we have been sent to speak the truth of the gospel, then I think there's these three questions we need to ask ourselves. The first thing is simply, have you been sent? Have you been sent? Um, I think, honestly, right, if, we, if, we, if I'm going to say that we've been sent to speak the truth, I think we need to start with just simply, have we been sent? And if I could answer uh, straightforward with you, yes. We have. We've been sent. I mean, this is kind of a rhetorical question of all three of them. This is a rhetorical one. Uh, you can look at Jesus' words himself, right, whenever Jesus had told his disciples, hey, I'm going to die this gruesome death, and I'm going to raise again, and I'm going to meet you on this mountain, and there we're, we're going to speak together, and I'm going I'm to see you there. It actually happens as Jesus says it's going to happen. And in Matthew chapter 28, actually in verse 17, it says that Jesus, like, shows up. And he's there with his disciples as he said he was going to. And some people worshiped him, but some of those same disciples doubted him. This, this Jesus, who you said is the Messiah, who you've been following for the last three years, like tells you exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to die. They're going to bury me. I'm going to be raised again. And I'll show up on this mountain and we're going to talk together. And I'm going to, I'm going to teach you about my kingdom. And you still doubt him. That's crazy. I don't know. Like I say that's crazy because I have 2,000 years to look back on and see that it happened this way, right? I don't know if I would have been any better in that situation, right? But Jesus then goes on to say, hey, listen, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. I'm sending you. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age." right? I'm sending you. You have been sent, right? Or you think about Acts chapter 1, verse 8, right? Whenever uh, Jesus is with his disciples right before he has ascended into heaven, what he says to them is, hey, they're asking, is this, the, is this whenever God's going to establish the kingdom here and now? And he says, the, the time is not for you to know what, what the Father set in place, but you're going to receive power, is what he says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. I'm sending you to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth, yeah, you know, the interesting part about this section in Romans chapter 10 is that there's at least an assumption on Paul's part that missionaries are being sent out from the church, that people are being called by God away from their livelihood, away from what they know to go and serve him in a full-time capacity. And one of the things I love about Carnival Christian Church is that we are a sending church, is that there are people who have grown up here who have then gone out to, to share the good news. They've been, they felt the call of God here on their life that, hey, I need to go. I need to do this with my life, and I'm going to go with, with the power of the Spirit and go and share the good news of the gospel. I think of people like, like James Bond and his wife, Whitney. This is a picture of them with their little daughter, Eden. They're, they're currently in Havana, Illinois, serving at the Havana Church of Christ, and James told me that as he's been sent, as he's going, he's been sent to speak that Jesus is the saving king, first and foremost. I think of, of people like Morgan, Morgan Novinger, who just graduated from Ozark, who's starting uh, a residency. She'll move later this week, actually, uh, to Southland Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky. And she told me that as she goes, right, as she goes, she's helping others see the heart of who Jesus is, who seeks to redeem and restore all of creation, all of which is only possible because of the power and the good news of the gospel, first and foremost. I think about uh, people like Brandon Musselman. And this is him and his wife, Alexia, and they're currently uh, serving in Manchester, New Hampshire at Movement Christian Church, where Brandon is actually transitioning to be teaching pastor right now. And when he got back with me yesterday, he actually said, hey, you'll never believe this. We just got done with a, a baptism service at the beach, and we just baptized eight people into Jesus. Right? And Brandon said that, that as they're going, they're speaking the good news of the gospel, first and foremost. And this is, this is 
what the kind of business Carnival Christian Church is in, right? This is the kind of business that the church is in, of sending people out to share the good news, to spread the gospel. Have you been sent? Yes, you have been sent. And honestly, let me just say this. Vocational ministry is not for everybody, but it is for somebody. And this might be for you. Maybe this is you sitting in this room right now and you've kind of felt God tugging on your heart to do something with your, like, something with your career for him and for his kingdom and for his, for his glory in a vocational sense to go serve the church, right? The church is in desperate need of more preachers and more youth pastors and more worship ministers and more counselors. The, the church is in need of more people to do that. And maybe God is calling you to that today. Maybe this is just serves as a wake-up call to, hey, don't, don't diminish what God might be calling you to do. But the flip side of it is that you have been sent is not just to go serve God full-time in your, in your ministry as, as your career for your vocation. This is a responsibility of all of us who believe in Jesus. We have been sent with the good news, right? This is, this is for all of us. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Ugh. I think, I think he said it that way because he knows the, the answer to the question, have you been sent? Well, yes, you've been sent. But I think there's another question we have to ask along with that is what should you say? So you've been sent, right? Well, what, what should you say? Um, I think in short, I would just say the gospel, right? I mean, that's what we've been talking about. That's what uh, a lot of people refer to the book of Romans as is the gospel to the Romans, right? Like this is, or Paul's gospel, like, God, uh, like Paul's been clearly defining the gospel in this letter, right? He starts in the first few chapters just saying, hey, we are flawed and sinful people, right? Like that we have fallen short of God's glorious standard, but because of the blood of Jesus, right, we have been justified, like we've been brought back into a relationship with God. We've been saved by grace through faith. And God loved us so much, Romans chapter five, God loved us so much that even while we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. And that we, when we trust in him and whenever we uh, put our faith in him and believe in him and are baptized, we are united with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, right? And we are no longer condemned because of our sin, but like there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is the good news, this is the gospel. What should you say? Like, speak the gospel. We talked about it last week, Timothy Keller's definition for the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe, yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. And let me just be honest with you here. This is normally the rub uh, of, of, of the general church-going crowd is this part of what, Paul, of what Paul's talking about. Like, how can anybody uh, preach unless they're sent, right? That word preach turns a lot of people off, right? Oh, well, I'm, I'm all right, man. I'm no preacher, right? I'm not gonna get up on that stage and preach the word, right? But the word that Paul uses here uh, could be translated herald. It's somebody who like stands in the streets and proclaims the good news. Somebody who's rubbing shoulders with other people and who is just speaking the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done. Literally, Tim Keller says it's people that are of the streets. And that's true about all of us. We all have different places that we go that we rub shoulders with, with other people, that we can go and speak the good news. As you go, take the gospel with you. That's what he's saying here. I love what 1 Peter chapter 2 says in the message version, verses 9 through 10. This is what it says. You are the ones chosen by God. You are chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people. You're God's instruments to do his work and to speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference that he made for you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. So what should you say? Man, simply the gospel. Man, speak the gospel in a way that's, hey, here's who I was, but here's who I am now because of the grace of God, because of the good news of the gospel. That's what we say as we go. But I think there's one more question that we have to ask of ourselves, and it's this. Have they heard you? Have they heard you? Like, have you actually spoken the words of the gospel out loud? One of the things I love about uh, or I admire about kids is uh, they're never ashamed to speak the truth, 
right? I think we're ashamed as parents sometimes that they're speaking the truth when they, when they just need to take a hint, you know, this isn't the right time for that. Um, uh, but they're never ashamed to share the truth. And sometimes it can be a little embarrassing, right? Uh, uh, last summer, we were on vacation in Branson, staying at this little like complex thing. And there was a pool that was shared with all the other people staying at their little Airbnbs or whatever. And it was nap time. So our youngest laid down for a nap. Uh, and my wife stayed with our youngest in our little Airbnb, and I took the other three to go swim, right, in this little shared pool complex. And we show up, and the, the pool really is probably about as big as the stage. It was not very big at all, um, and it was packed, okay? There were probably 20 people wanting to swim in this pool. That's like six feet is the deep end, four feet is the shallow end. It's just a hole with water in it. And, uh, but this is where you go to beat the heat, right? And literally, there's no swimming happening. You're just kind of sitting there, especially when there's 20 people there, you're just kind of chilling out, you know? Unless you're a three-year-old, five-year-old, and seven-year-old, and you have goggles, and then it's like, man, there's trees all over the place. We're like dodging people underwater and stuff. I was like, I'm not getting it. I don't want to really touch somebody that I just met, you know, while I'm in the pool, right? I don't want to accidentally bump up to them. It's not exactly my idea of vacation, right? So I'm staying clear of this, right? And I'm outside of it. My kids are playing their own game. Sam gets on his tiptoes. My, at the time, three-year-old gets on his tiptoes in the shallow end where he can see he's got this little arm floaty life jacket thing on. And Sam just starts, just bursts into song, and we had been going through the New City Catechism uh, for kids where we're learning different truths about God. And Sam just gets his bearings about him and just starts going, God is the creator of everyone and everything. God is the creator of everyone and everything. And I thought he was done, but he wasn't done. He was like, of everyone and everything, of everyone and everything. God is the creator of everyone and everything, right? That's what Sam does. Thank you. Thank you, right? Oh, man. <laughs> what happened during that 20 seconds was the stark contrast between how kids feel about generally speaking the truth and how adults feel generally about speaking the truth without worrying about what everybody else, because as Sam is belting out the song, I'm outside the pool, scrambling, trying to figure out how, how to make him shut his mouth, right? I'm just like, man, just stop, Sam. Like, I'm like, stop, stop, right? Oh, man. But what's one thing we know for sure, right, is that we don't have to wonder. I don't have to wonder if any of the people at the pool heard him that day, right? I heard one author say it this way, the gospel is not good news if it doesn't get there in time. And listen, there are plenty of sermons, there's plenty of lessons, there's plenty of passages in our Bibles that talk about the love of God and how we are supposed to share that love of God. Actually, Jesus himself says, hey, I, a new command I give you, love one another. This is how people are going to know that you're my disciples if you love one another. But this is not, this is not what Romans chapter 10 verses 13 through 15 is saying. I think sometimes we become, we can become preoccupied with loving people and being kind to people that we fail to ever share the good news of the gospel with them. We fail to ever open our mouths and speak the message out loud. And in turn, the way that, the way that Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 10 is that they don't have a chance to hear and believe and respond and call on the name of the Lord when we don't open our mouths and speak the truth of the gospel. And that's what we've been called to do, is to speak the truth of the gospel. We do this sometimes, right? Well-intentioned, we do this, right? We're like, I'm gonna be kind to people, right? So we smile at our barista at Starbucks, right? And say thank you, like over the top, like we hold the smile for an extra couple seconds, right? And we think to ourselves that, yeah, they know. They know I believe in Jesus and that, I am more sinful and flawed than I could ever dare believe and more, but at the same time, more loved and accepted in Jesus than I ever dare hope, right? They know because I smiled a little bit longer, right? But do they? Or are we like, we tell the coach, the coach uh, for our kids, T-ball team or whatever, we're thankful for them and we're like, yeah, you get it. Christ died for you, right? Even when you were still in your sin, right? <laughs> like, you know that like, they know, they know that's what I meant when I said, thank you for your time this year coaching my crazy son, right? I don't know. 
Or we like give a big tip to our waiter or waitress at the restaurant and we think, yeah, they know, right? They know that's really from Jesus and it's really because he's been so generous with me that I want to be generous with other people and I want to spread his love to everyone I come in contact with and we know that like, he knows that you're a sinful person but because of the, of the blood of Jesus, you've been justified, you've been brought back into a right relationship, you've been redeemed, brought into the saving relationship. If you would just trust in him and surrender your life to him, then you can have this life in him, right? And listen, I'm... I'm I want to emphasize, I'm not downplaying the fact that we need to do good things and love people well, because I think a lot of times that's what leads to opportunities to share the good news, right? But that's not what Paul is necessarily telling us in this passage. Paul quotes Isaiah and says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The quote is not, how beautiful are the feet of those who do good things, Because your good things cannot and will not ever overshadow the good news of the gospel. They just won't. They're not as powerful as the good news of the saving news of the gospel that Jesus came and died and rose again and has brought you back into a relationship with him. Right? Like that is the most important thing that you could say. So have people heard you? Because, again, the truth of Romans 10, 13 through 15, is that you and I are sent to speak the truth of the gospel. We have to speak it out loud. Uh, To end our time together, we're going to take communion here in just a second. At these tables around the room, you'll find the emblems. You'll find the little bread that represents the body of of Jesus that was given for you. you. You'll find the blood that was poured out for you. And, and we're going we're gonna to go and, and take those. But we also want to give you a chance to just think about practically what does this look like? How do, how do I practically share the good news of the gospel with people that I interact with? So you'll find one of these little cards. There's nothing special about these cards that are on the table. There could be something special about how you use this card. Uh, and really, we were talking about it. I was talking about it with Haddon, and he said, uh, the church that they're going to serve in, in Vegas uh, uses this, uh, this, these terms, this, this simple terminology, and we stole it from them. So it's just places and faces. Where, where are the regular places that you go? And honestly, school being done, we're into summer, and, and some of those routines are, are shifting and changing, right? So what, where are the places that we're going to go this summer? Where are the places we're going to find ourselves most often? And what are my opportunities to share the good news, Right? if that's in the Walmart pickup line or at the coffee shop or in my home and with my, with my neighbors in my neighborhood or at Chick-fil-A, right? Where's my opportunities to, to share the good news? And we think of the faces, those, those family members or those friends or those neighbors or those baristas or those workers, whatever it looks like. Well, where's, who are the faces that I'm coming in contact with and who needs to hear the good news? Because we've been sent to speak the good news of the gospel. I guess I have one more question. Have you called on the name of the Lord? That's what Paul says. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you called on his name? Have you heard the truth of the gospel? Have you believed in him? And have you called on his name? I said, God, I trust you. Jesus, I, I, I know that you really did what you, what you said you were going to do. I really, I really believe that you did die on that cross for me, and you really did raise three days later. I really believe this. Did you, have you called out to him? Uh, Paul answers, like, how do we do this? A few, a few verses earlier in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, he says it this way. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And honestly, Paul says in a different one of his letters to the Corinthian church, he says, hey, when we go to the tables, when we gather and we remember the sacrifice of Jesus and we, and we uh, partake in this, in this time of communion, we are proclaiming Christ's death until he returns. So as we're going, we are reconfessing Jesus is Lord. And we are confirming our belief that God really did raise him from the dead that this is the truth we're gonna build our lives on. This is the truth of the gospel. This is, what we're gonna, this is what we're gonna build our lives on. So have you believed 
in the gospel? Have you confessed that Jesus is Lord? Have you called on the name of the Lord? Uh, there's gonna be people up front here. There's gonna be people in the back that are ready to pray with you. If that's something you need to, to make a decision or maybe, maybe you're thinking about, man, what is God calling me to? Who is God calling me to? And you wanna talk and, and pray uh, with somebody about that. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you. But if you're, if you're wondering when's the right time, the time is now. Like, let's not wait any longer. Let's, we've, we've heard the good news of the gospel. Now, do we believe it? Do we respond? Do we call to the Lord to be saved? If you need to call on the name of the Lord, we ask that you do that this morning. You come, have a conversation as we go to the table. So let me pray for us. God, we love you and we are just thankful that you have done what, what was impossible for us to do. Lord, all of our effort, all of our spinning of our wheels, all of our trying, Lord, we could not earn a way to be in a relationship with you. We cannot do anything to earn favor with, with you. But Lord, you've freely given it to us because you sent your son to die in our place and you raised him from the dead and we believe that. Lord, I pray that that wouldn't just be something we remember as we take these emblems around this room, but it'd be something that, that just penetrates into the depths of our heart and just like burns in us to the point that we can't hold it to ourselves anymore. We have to share it. Lord, I pray that you would send us into our communities, into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, into our homes to speak the truth of the gospel with everyone we come in contact with. But we thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And it's in his, in his, in his name that we pray right now. Amen.